I think the most important thing is to find a balance between the things that I think are important because they are things that I have learned over many years as a composer and as a teacher with the particular needs that each student has. Especially in the world of music composition, students come to teachers with extremely different wishes and extremely different levels of preparation. And at a certain point, this expansion widens out into like a big river. And then the teacher will say to the student, now you can play anything. You can choose what to play. But with composing, it's much more complicated because first of all, we have many different kinds of music. We have composers who want to write old-fashioned classical music. We, want, we have composers who want to experiment. They want to do things that they hope nobody else has ever done before. If I look at all of the students who come to me and I say, okay, now you do this and you do this, and little by little you get to a point, and then I say, now you can compose any music you want, no, that's wrong. It's a balance between what I think is important and what the student wants to do. Today, Greece 사람들은 신과의 합의를 위해서 소의 가족을 산채로 찍고 피를 마신다고 해요. 그래서 그런 어떤 황홀경적인 경험의 매력을 느껴서 그 매력에 대한 저 나름의 정치를 곡으로 표현하고 그 표현한 곡을 전혀 다른 삶을 살아온 교수님과 한번 나누어 보고 싶어서 이렇게 공유를 하게 됐습니다. Okay, bravo. Very good. So, before we begin to talk about your piece and about you, I just want to say a couple of things about what a composition masterclass is, because I think almost all composition, uh, all masterclasses, almost all masterclasses, are instrumental masterclasses or singing master classes or conducting master classes. And one thing that all of those master classes have in common is that the person who is the subject of the master class, the student, is playing something or singing something or conducting something, making live music. But a composition master class is very different because it's a master class about the music itself not about playing it, not about singing it, not about conducting it, but about composing it. The other thing that's interesting about a master class is that some master classes are just between the teacher and the student. Other master classes are really about what the teacher has to say about that student, but really the master class is for the whole audience, for everybody who is in the room. 
What I would like to do now is to talk to you as if there were many, many other composers in the room. Oh. And the things that I want to say to you are things that might be useful for lots of composers, even though the only person who composed this piece mm. is you. So let me start by asking you a few questions so that I understand better what this piece is. So of course, it's quite a short piece. And it has a name. The name is ecstasy. And that word, ecstasy, describes an emotion, right? Yeah. Extremely right. happy, Yeah. right? But it doesn't describe a type of piece, such as impromptu, or etude, or sonata, or symphony. If you wrote a piece, and, or prelude, if you wrote a piece and you called it prelude number one, then I would immediately connect it to Chopin preludes. And Chopin preludes are short pieces. Why? But if you said piano sonata number 73, then I would say, hmm, piano sonata. It's a little <laughs> bit small for a piano sonata. In other words, I would have something to compare it to. Mm. But the name of this piece is Ecstasy. So I don't really understand yet, but I hope you will tell me, whether this piece is meant to be by itself, just one small piece, or maybe is this piece one piece out of a collection or a set of mm. pieces. So tell me what you think right now. Do you think this piece is by itself, or is it going to be part of a group of pieces? If I compose more short piano solo piece, then the, this piece name may be ecstasy or some emotion languages, but not yet. OK. I tell you, I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. Because it matters as far as the length of the piece and also the structure of the piece. If, let us take, for example, Schubert impromptus. Are you familiar with Schubert impromptus? Yeah. OK. So those pieces can be played as a set of pieces, or they can be played each one separately. Mm. If I were playing a piano recital, and I would like to play a Schubert impromptu, I might just play one, or maybe two, not all of them. Mm. Uh, and if I wanted to play one or two, then I could put other pieces by Stravinsky, Bartok, Bach, mm. Brahms. And one Schubert impromptu would seem enough, because the Schubert impromptus are not short pieces. But if I wanted to play a piano recital, and I wanted to play a Chopin prelude, mm. I wouldn't play just one, because they're too short. I would have to play at least maybe three or four or five, or maybe I play all of them, all 24 of them. Because one by itself just doesn't feel satisfying. It's not a musically satisfying experience. But more than that, it's just not really a, a good way to present that music, because those pieces are meant to be played as a group. That's why I'm asking about your piece. Uh, because if you're thinking about it as a complete work that should be played by itself and not with perhaps three or four other pieces of similar length, different music, different style, different material, maybe very slow, maybe very contrapuntal, but nevertheless part of a group, then I would say this piece is really good mm. in terms of this size. Mm. But if you think that this piece stands by itself, then I think this piece is too short. Mm. Because it do, the material in this piece is not developed very much. I agree about that. Yeah. Another good example of a composer who wrote a lot of piano pieces, and I am sure you know this composer because your piece reminds me of it, is Scriabin. You like Scriabin, don't you? Yeah, my, yeah. one of my favorite. Of course. Pieces. I never met you until this morning, but I know that that's <laughs> true because this piece tells me that you love Scriabin. Mm. And Scriabin wrote long pieces, like the piano sonatas, and he also wrote very short pieces, like the preludes of Scriabin. Very short. 
even shorter than your piece. So when we talk about those kinds of pieces, like the Scriabin Preludes or the Chopin Preludes, and there are many other collections of very short pieces, we don't really worry about the idea of development because development is not the point of those pieces. Mm. Those pieces are like bursts of energy, mm. very fast bursts of intense energy. And we are only a little bit familiar with the music and comfortable with where it's going, and then it's over, mm. finished. That's a little bit shocking, but that's the nature of that kind of piece. That kind of piece is supposed to be like that. Like you open up a door and you see a beautiful world, but then it shuts almost immediately. That's a very powerful way of making music. But then, as I said, there's also another way, like the Scriabin sonatas, like the ninth, do you know the ninth sonata? Yes. You remember how it begins? Dee da dee da dee. It, it's a very mysterious, like you wrote in your score, Grave Misterioso. That piece is also very mysterious. And it, it really only has two ideas. Dee da dee da dee. And then da 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 da. Only two little ideas. But he really develops them over the course of this sonata. He needs to develop that material. His idea for this piece is that it's not a short piece, that it's a long piece. But he uses very similar musical ideas in the preludes, but he doesn't develop them because he doesn't need to. So all of what I'm trying to say is it's necessary for you to decide. Mm -hmm. Decide. How does this piece work? Is it one complete piece mm -hmm. or is it a small piece that's part of a collection of pieces, maybe six pieces. Mm -hmm. Because then you understand whether or not you should develop mm -hmm. your material. You don't need to decide right now. However, you do need to decide. Mm -hmm. You must decide. Because if this is not supposed to be one piece out of a group of pieces, then you must do more. Mm -hmm. It's, it doesn't work by itself like this. 세상을 이해하는 방법에는 여러 가지가 있잖아요. 누구는 종교로 바라보기도 하고, 누구는 과학을 통해서 바라보기도 하고. 작곡가는 음악을 쓸때 음악이라는 세계를 창조하기 위해서 논리를 스스로 만들 수 있다는 점에서 하나의 꿈을 꾸거나 아니면 신이 된것 같은 기분을 느낄 때가 종종 있습니다. 그런 부분에서 되게 흥미를 느끼지 않나 싶습니다. Okay, one minute and 10 seconds. That's how long this part takes. A very important word here is proportion. Do you know this word, proportion? Yeah. Okay, so what we are doing right now is we are understanding the proportional relationship between the first part and the second part. Before you play it, I want to explain something. It is a very, very long tradition in piano music to have a piece that begins with a slow introduction and then a fast section. Normally, most of the time, the slow introduction is perhaps one quarter of the whole piece. The mm -hmm. other part is three quarters. Could even be one fifth or one sixth. That is the tradition. 
you are not required to do it according to the tradition, but when you write a piece for piano, which is a traditional instrument, and when you write a piece that has a slow part and then a fast part, we cannot help listening in the context of the tradition. If your piece is short, then I and everybody else compares it to the Scriabin preludes and the Chopin preludes and pieces by Bartok, pieces by Brahms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, you cannot escape this problem because everybody knows lots of piano music. You do not exist by yourself. So if you could please uh, play the rest of the piece, and I want to see how long that takes, OK? OK. Go ahead. Fifty seconds. <laughs> okay, so it is a little bit strange that the fast music is shorter than the slow music. The balance doesn't feel right. Yeah. So now we have the question: Do you make the slow part at the beginning smaller, or do you make the fast part longer? Another possibility is to make it a three-part form in which the fast music stops and then we have slow music again. Of course, that's possible. We could even add new material and make it into a five-part form or seven or something else. But I'm not convinced right now the way it is. And I know that you're not even sure if the piece is finished. It's complete, right? You're not sure yet. Yeah. You just finished this yesterday or maybe the day yeah. before. Yeah. So you, you don't really have uh, a, a clear understanding of the complete piece mm -hmm. yet. I would like to tell you why I think that the fast section should be longer than the first slow section. Because it's about energy. When the fast music begins, it immediately works on a completely different level of energy. And this energy continues to build as the, the music continues. This energy reaches, at some point, a place where it needs to be released. And there are many different ways, as composers, that we have to release this kind of energy. We can play even faster music that gets even louder and even faster and even more difficult to play, like fireworks that are going off in the sky. But it takes some time to develop that energy. Or we can cut it off like that and then, <gasps> now what? Now, now what do we do? And then start something completely different. That's another way of releasing that energy. But the way you, you have left me with this piece is you have given me this energy, and I'm all excited. And yeah, ecstasy, for sure. <laughs> Very good, ecstasy, yeah? But I'm like this, you know? I, now I need, I need something to release the energy, something. And the ending of the piece doesn't really do that yet. What do you think? Do you, do you agree with me about that? Yeah, I agree about yeah. that. So let me ask you, I know that you haven't really finished the piece yet, but I'm going to ask you if you could try to keep playing the piece some more. Now, improvise. Mm. Can you do that? Yeah, sure. All right. So why don't you start again from the beginning of the fast music, from you know, where, where the fast music begins, and see if you can find a way of 
releasing the energy for me. Okay? Try. 섬세함이라고 말하고 싶어요. 되게 단점이자 장점인데 어떤 성부나 어떤 음영이나 이런 거 하나 하나에도 좀 집착하는 경향이 조금 있는 것 같습니다. No what? <laughs> okay, but that was really good. Bravo. All I right. Appreciate it. Good. Yeah. So, I understand your strategy. Your strategy is okay. This music, this movement, music. Put it together. Okay, that's a good strategy. Very good strategy. So, the the problem that you have to solve with this strategy is how to manage the slow music and the fast music together. And you've created this. Very interesting idea where the, there's almost they're happening at the same time. The slow music continues, and then we have these little moments yeah, of exactly. fascinating. Yeah, it's good. It works perfectly well with your piece. Okay, when you uh, modulated up a half step, I was I wanted to stop you because I wanted to say, oh wait, whoa, oh now we're talking about a much bigger piece mm. because you were going to a different harmonic place. And I thought maybe this means that um, that this is going to become a 15-minute piece. So you have to be careful when you are still thinking of maybe five minutes or six minutes at the most, maybe even four minutes. Mm -hmm. Remember, I timed the first slow part; it was one minute and mm -hmm. ten seconds, and then I timed the fast part; that was 50 seconds. So mm -hmm. of course, that makes two minutes. Mm -hmm. Maybe. In order for this piece to be uh, a complete self-contained work that is not part of a set, probably it wants to be at least five minutes, something like that. In any case, I think the, to me, my own personal opinion is that I think this piece wants to be part of a set of pieces. I really like this material, the slow material and the fast material. I think it's really, really good musical material. But it feels to me that it doesn't really want to be stretched out a lot. I mm -hmm. think it sits very nicely just like this. Mm -hmm. So when I said before that I would like all of this accumulating energy to be released, I think the, the scale on which you did that was maybe an, you maybe played an extra minute, maybe an extra minute and a half. So maybe the whole thing when you played it before was like three and a half minutes. That feels good. That feels good to me. And I think that if you had a group of pieces, three pieces, four pieces, five pieces, maybe every one of them could be ecstasy. Mm. 
different ecstasy, mm -hmm. you know. I think that could be a really nice collection of piano pieces. I want to ask you some questions about this piece. So let's go back to the first part at the beginning. I thought when I was looking at this piece before you sent it to me yesterday, mm -hmm. and I looked at it yesterday, I thought that you were going to play the chords at the beginning with your left hand, mm -hmm. and then you were going to play the other things all with your right hand, like this, and then like this, and like this, but you didn't do that. Could you try that right now? I, I have a reason that I'm saying this. Could you start the piece again, and this time keep the chords always in the left hand? Try. Mm -hmm. think I asked you to do that? When I played that right hand, mm -hmm. it should more position moving. But when I played left hand, it ever less position moving. So I guess you play always left hand. Exactly. Exactly right. I said to you a little while ago, that I really like this material. I like it a lot. I think it's really beautiful. Both the slow stuff and the fast stuff. It's both of them really good. The reason I like this slow material so much is because of the, the sound of this chord. La, si, la, si. It's very beautiful and it's very still. It's very, like, calm. Mm. But the rhythm is not exactly predictable. It is a pattern. I looked at it for a couple of minutes to say to myself, okay, is this a pattern or is this not a pattern? Yes, it is. It is a pattern. You have these three bars of 6-8 and then you have one bar of 5-8 and the rhythmic pattern is mm -hmm. clear. But it's not dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, dum. It's longer than that yeah. and more interesting than that. So we have this very interesting balance between, on one hand, we just have the same notes, dum, 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 but we have, uh, we have the same color, but we have a slightly less predictable rhythm. And that creates a really, really, really good balance. Mm -hmm. To me, it's very important that that sound is always exactly the same. So that when you're constantly doing this, it makes it harder to do that. Yeah. And I don't see why you should make it harder. And you can easily reach down here mm -hmm. and reach up here, no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Also, it helps to clarify the idea of two things going on at the same time. We have dum, 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 and then we have this, and then we have this, and we have this, and so on. Just put it in the score so it's very clear that this is always in the left hand. Or you could put LH sempre, mm. and then it's clear, yeah. you know. But I think that's better. It's not a big difference, but I think it's a difference that will also help another pianist, somebody who plays this piece mm -hmm. that's not you, who is not you. It helps another pianist to understand the sense of this music, the meaning of this music. And there's another thing that you can do. If you choose, to end the piece the way you were improvising before, where you put the two ideas together, then you can come back to this idea, dum, 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 but you can do this, you know? So like, rethink the idea in a different form. Mm -hmm. Now there is a dynamic, uh, more energetic use of the same material. No longer is it like, like the surface of the ocean, just like that. But it has energy, you know? So it's a way of bringing the music back to the way it was at the beginning, but different, mm. different idea. Similar, developed, but not the same.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank Very you. appreciated. Right. We are, are here to talk about a piano piece by Jun Hyuk Park. In this case, since we're going to be talking about this piece without actually hearing it played on a piano, we're going to listen to a version of this piece called MIDI. It's important to keep in mind that MIDI is good in some ways and really bad in other ways. What's good about it is that it gives you exactly the right notes, can never play a wrong note, like human beings can play wrong notes, can never play a wrong note. It gives you the correct rhythms, it gives you the correct tempo. But that's all that's good about MIDI. Everything else about MIDI is really bad because it is not human, so there is no expressive character in the music. There is no human understanding of the music. It's very, very stiff. So we're going to listen first to the uh, MIDI performance of this piece, interpretation of this piece, which is called Impromptu. So let's listen to it. Okay. Bravo. <laughs> Actually, bravo to you. It really is a fine, fine piece. Really great. The energy that this piece has at the end has reached a, a kind of, of level of climax that 
I think most composers would take these, these last few bars and make the ending a big ball of fire. <laughs> but you didn't do that. You yeah, did I, something... I release it. Yeah, you release it. But <laughs> you release it very quickly. Right. Just, uh, can you actually, can we just play the last 10 seconds of it? Okay. Yeah, just that last little phrase there is so beautiful. It's just really elegant. I actually have worked with many, many composers uh, over my lifetime. And I have said actually quite a lot of times in situations similar to this one, do you really have to do it the way everybody else does it? Do you really have to end with a big chord? I mean, it's a, a little bit predictable, right? Yeah, How about right. something else? And you did it. That's great. <laughs> it's really good. So yeah, I like this piece a lot. I'd like to go back to the beginning um, for two reasons. The first is to talk about the title. Mm -hmm. And so let me ask you, tell me what the word impromptu means to you in this piece. Actually, there is no specific things that I want to show in this, in this music, through this music. And actually, I, I try to use very many musical um, moments or musical phenomenon from the very, very minimum musical idea. Mm -hmm. I use it very, I started with a very small idea mm -hmm. and I uh, expanded that idea very various parts of the musical materials. This progress was very, seems like improvisation to me, so I put the title like that. Good, that makes perfect sense. The word impromptu is a word that I have heard since I was a little boy because I took piano lessons from a very young age. I'm not even sure what language it comes from. We, we use it in English, right. but it's not originally an English word. It could be an Italian word, but mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure. However, it is a word that has a Latin uh, basis, a Latin root, mm -hmm. and it is connected, I think, to improvisation. Yeah, right. I think you're right. And even if that isn't technically where the word comes from, the common meaning of impromptu is exactly as you say, like unexpected, mm -hmm. improvised, uh, not planned. Mm -hmm. And so when I was listening to this piece this last time and thinking about it in the context of the title, I was asking myself, does it actually present itself to me, the listener, as something in which there are unpredictable things. Mm -hmm. In a way, easier for me to see that than it is for you, even though you know this piece far better than I do, <laughs> because none of it is an accident or an improvisation for you, because you wrote it all. Yeah, right. But I am in a position, like everybody else, mm -hmm. to actually react to whether it does sound like, instead of going like this, it actually goes like this. And in fact, I think it does do that. Uh, the piece begins in a way which, as you said, you're using a minimal idea, yeah, right. meaning just it starts with one idea and there's really nothing else for quite a while. Mm -hmm. The whole first page of the piece is that way. And it's not until we get to the third bar on page two where we have anything other than that first idea. And then we have four more bars of the first idea and then we have a development of that second idea and then back to the first idea, and that's really the whole first section of the piece. Yeah, right. And then at letter B, on the third page, we begin something that apparently is new, but it's actually built out of the same material that you already yeah, right. started with. that's right. So it's um, a very economic use of material. Mm -hmm. That by itself contradicts the idea of impromptu, right? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like the whole piece is unfolding in a very logical way from just yeah, right. one or maybe two ideas. Before we go any farther though, I want to ask you whether this piece feels like it's a complete self-contained piece or whether it is maybe part of a, a set in the future. What I do think, you think this is the single piece for this, yeah. only this. Yeah, I, I think that makes mm -hmm. sense. 
Okay, so we were talking about this piece before this master class, and what I was asking you about is these little things that, uh, that happen all over the place in the first part where you have two repeated notes. And sometimes you can play the repeated notes with two hands like this, but other times you're forced because of what's going on in the music to play the repeated notes with one hand. And the problem is that at this tempo, quarter note equals more or less 120, when you have two notes to be played by the same hand repeated like da da, you can't really play it at this tempo or maybe you almost can, but if you do, just because of the way the human muscles work and the hand and the way the piano works, it has to be loud. Mm -hmm. There's just no choice, it has to be loud. But in your piece, sometimes you don't want it loud, you want it soft, but that's really hard to do. So we were talking about this and I said, would you consider having the tempo a little bit slower? Yeah, right. Because if the tempo is a little bit slower, then you can do that. So I asked you if you could re or ask the computer to re-record it at a slightly slower tempo, and then we could see how that sounds. Well, let's start maybe just the first, I don't know, 20 seconds of the 120 again, just so that, so that the people who are watching this master class okay. can, can hear how you originally wanted it. My point is that I'm going to be the idea. 이제 그게 그거 자체로는 굉장히 좋은 장점이지만 이제 반대로는 곡을 하나 완성시키는 데에서는 최소한의 아이디어를 가지고 그거를 이제 조리 있게 이제 풀어내야 되는 경우가 많아서 항상 제가 곡을 써가면 제가 사용한 아이디어들을 좀 소거하라는 피드백을 많이 받는 것 같습니다. Here. No, no, keep going. Keep going. Okay. So we can hear that, um, I hope you could hear that there are all these places where you have da da And the da is two notes played by one hand, by the left hand. But at the very beginning, it's just da da with one hand, or I'm sorry, one note with two hands, one after the other, da, 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 or da, da, da. And because of, as I say, because of the way the human hand and the muscles and the piano are, you really are forced to doing that forte. So I said, what happens if we take it a little slower? And so you re-recorded it at 100. Let's hear how that sounds. So we can hear, it, it sounds almost the same. It's a, a very interesting little experiment to do, isn't it? It's close enough that I think we both agreed that it's okay, no. right? But <laughs> the problem is that maybe the, not all of the rest of the piece is okay at this tempo. That's what I was saying to you before. So let's find a place where, okay, let's take the second section. Good, perfect. Okay. Now, could you find the same thing at the 120? Let's see what that sound what the original version sounds like. Now we get into a really interesting question because music is an art, it's not a science. Right. You know, if I say I like this second version better and I'm a scientist, I need to give evidence, right? I need to give proof. But if I'm an artist, I just have to say I like it better and 
you can't tell me I'm wrong. You can tell me you don't agree with me, but you can't tell me I'm wrong. I like it better at the faster speed. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you I think so too. You think so too? Yeah, right. yeah. To me, the B section in the original tempo of 120 sounds like there's energy. In the, at, at 100, it feels like mm, 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 mm. It's like, how much of this do we have to hear? You know? <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's moving forward. Mm. It is moving forward, but maybe not enough. Do you have an idea for how you could somehow manage to get the best of both things? Mm. I thought that um, keep the tempo in 120. And how about write these the repeating mm -hmm. notes as uh, um, some kind of akasatora? Mm. Like the slashed notes. Yeah. And I think that uh, the player doesn't have to be very strict via the, this rhythm. They can also recognize that notes should be very short. So I can, the player could choose the length of the notes very freely. Right. So I can, yeah. Yeah, especially when the repeated notes are not forte, when they're piano. Yeah, right. So they might need to be just a tiny little bit slower. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's perfect. I love your idea. I had a different idea, mm -hmm. but actually now that you say what you think, I think I like your idea better. But here's what I thought uh, when I was thinking about, is there a solution to this problem? And I thought, well, maybe the solution is, just before the second section begins, those low D-sharp repeating notes, you make a little bit of a retardando, mm -hmm. and then you go into a faster speed here. Mm -hmm. So the music at letter B, the second section of the piece, is not at the same tempo as the beginning. So in other words, the beginning could be at 100, yeah, right. and then the second section it actually is at 120, mm -hmm. or something similar to that. You know, yeah. And so that every one of these places where you have the repeating notes the whole tempo is brought down just a little bit, and then when you have the driving, forward-looking, forward-motion eighth notes, which really, they just feel better at a faster speed, they are at a faster speed. However, I think I like your idea better. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, the good thing it, when you talk to a, a teacher or another musician who is not officially a teacher, but another musician who has an opinion that you can respect, it's good to have choices, mm, right, right. you know? When you see what you're doing, not as I, I have to do it this way, but you know, someone's giving me, or three or four different people are giving me ideas, then I can understand my pathway more easily because I have choices. Mm. That, I think, is just the way life is. Some, some of us move faster than others do. But I think we all have to work hard. You know, just because some people are faster doesn't mean that they don't have to work hard. Because if they don't work hard, they're not going to realize the potential that they have. For someone who doesn't move so fast, well, they also have to work hard. But, you know, it's not a competition. I mean, it is a competition, but at some point we all get there, right? So if a very talented kid gets there at the age of 11, and somebody else, it takes until that kid is 17 to get there. Well, at the age of 17, if they don't work very hard, they're in the same place. So if the 11-year-old wants to continue to, to make an improvement, even though she's very talented, she has to work hard. The 17-year-old also has to work hard. I think working hard is, is necessary no matter how much talent you have. But I don't think of talent as something that is somehow, you know, coming from God. I think talent is just some people are faster than others. I think it's probably that simple. We all know that the piano has 88 keys, and we all know that the low notes of the piano and the high notes of the piano are very different from each other, not just because the low notes are very low in pitch and the high notes are very high in pitch, but because they ring in a completely different way. The, the, the density of the sound mm -hmm. of low notes is completely different right. from the high notes. Of course, between the bottom and the top, there is a steady increase in sharpness of the notes, but there's a steady decrease of the resonance of the right. notes. 
And every really good composer of piano music from the present and from the past recognizes that and uses that as a big part of how they write for the piano. Of course, when we were listening to the MIDI version, mm -hmm. incremental change in, dis in, in um, resonance from a lot at the lowest part of the keyboard to very little at the top of the keyboard, we don't even really hear it on MIDI because the computer sound, yes, it's trying to imitate, imitate the piano, but it, it, it's not at all close to the way a piano really sounds. This section here before letter C, do you think you could find that? It doesn't matter which tempo. Good. This density sound. Okay, good. So obviously what you're doing there, which is really, really cool, is you're using the way the density changes from the top of the keyboard, almost the top of the keyboard, right. to actually the very bottom. The, very bottom. The, the, the bottom note in the left hand is the very <laughs> lowest note of the keyboard. So you're taking full advantage of this feature, this yeah, quality right. of the instrument, which is great. You try that on a real piano, and it's even more powerful, much, much more powerful. Right. So the question then would be, from the point of view of the overall structure of the piece and the overall balance of the piece, do we want this to be an, a unique, non-repeating individual event, or do we want some kind of musical response to this? When I was thinking about it, I thought, well, actually there is a little bit of a response at the very end, because the left hand is moving down and it goes, I don't know, that's not the lowest note, is it? Or is it? I think is that actually the lowest? Okay. Right. So, so the left hand actually goes right back down to the lowest note again at the very end of the piece and the right hand moves in contrary motion. So if you're watching the pianist's hands, they're going like this and the right hand of the piano ends up, I don't know, is that the top note? It's an A. It's, so it's almost the top note of the piano. So we actually have that, um, we have that uh, uh, re sort of response already. However, what we don't have in this piece is both hands way up at the top. I'm not telling you that you need to do that. What I am telling you is that your piece has made me think of that. Mm -hmm. Your piece has made me wonder if it would be a good idea to have a response from that to this. If this were the keyboard, it would be here and here. What you actually did was at the end, as I said, I showed before you're doing this, but I wonder whether this could also be um, an idea. It could be an idea, especially if you were thinking at all of expanding this piece. Mm -hmm. So that brings me actually to my only other question, which is about structure, about form. Do you feel satisfied that this piece structurally is in a good place? Or are you still wondering whether maybe it could have some real changes in it? I'm not talking about a note change or a little rhythm change, but actually like well, uh, an, additional cha an additional section uh -huh. or anything. Or do you really feel satisfied with it the way it is? The last section must be a little bit longer than this original version. Thank you. Exactly, exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> we are in 100% agreement. agreement. I think the last think section the last needs section a little needs bit a more. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe this might give an opening for what I was suggesting, a place where both hands mm -hmm. are playing 16th notes at or near the top of the keyboard. Yeah. You know, you know, it's it's a funny thing. Is this is this a logical answer, or is this an emotional answer? And that gets back to the question that we were talking about before, okay. which is the question that you asked me about mm -hmm. the relationship between emotion and logic in composing. So what I'm suggesting as a possibility is that you take advantage of a logical connection. You know, it's like almost like a, 
like a physical reaction. You know, if I drop this bottle, then there's a reaction. Now, this bottle will probably just turn over and get water all over my computer. But if I, if I drop it in exactly the right way, it will bounce back up a little bit, right? And that bounce is a necessary physical reaction inside of the real world. That's a, a logical thing. And scientists from a long time ago figured out exactly what should happen if I drop this bottle perfectly so that it comes up. They, some scientists could tell me exactly how high it's going to go. In music, because we have an art and not a science, we don't worry about the exact calculation. But we do still wonder about the logical connection between the consequence of doing this and whether this should be a response. Again, I'm trying to be really clear. I'm not saying that you must put in that thing. I'm saying that your piece made me think of it. Because part of my existence as a composer is logical. There is another part that's purely emotional. And the emotional part probably wouldn't think of that. But the, the practical, logical part thinks, well, you know, if there's this, then there should be this. If there's this, there should be this. Anyway, that's the, uh, the last thing I wanted to say. And I think we've run out of time. So oh. anyway, but I really love this piece. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. All right. Thank Yosuto 어, 굉장히 실용적인 부분까지 봐주셨던 점이 좋았습니다. 예를 들어서 연주가 진짜로 가능한가 불가능한가를 떠나서 제가 표현하려고 하던 게 있었으면 그 표현하고자 하는 거를 어떻게 해야 좀더 효과적으로 효과적인 방법으로 이제 청중들에게 표현하게 할수 있는지 어, 제 의도를 어떻게 하면 더잘 전달할 수 있는지 등을 알려주신 것 같아서 좋았습니다. 교수님을 직접 very simple answer. Listen to what your teachers say and then forget about it. That's it.